you're going to die if you drink it. Stop lying to God and stop lying to yourself. And that's exactly what idolatry will do. Destroy you. You have to examine who in the right mind would drink gas. It's time that we were biblical. Revelations chapter 2. Ready? To the angel of the church of Pergamon, write, these are the words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. So it's God. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, nor even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites into sin, so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon will come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth, which is the double-edged sword. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Holy Spirit says to the church, to the one who is victorious. I give some to the hidden man. And I also give the person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Okay, so let me go through this. First, Pergamon. Let's deal with it. This is the capital of Rome for Asia. In, in, in uh, Roman times, they had different capitals. Yes, the Roman city, Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire, but in Africa, they would have another city as the African capital where the Caesar would go and everybody from Africa would come to deal with business. Pergamon was the capital for Asia. So the Caesar would go to Pergamon and all the people who wanted to deal with them from Asia would go there. The second thing you need to know is that it became famous under Alexander the Great. And also, this was an educational learning center. Now listen to me carefully. The city was made up of a bunch of universities and colleges and so forth. It had a library that had over 200,000 scrolls. Now a scroll would be at least two feet long and they had over 200,000 written scrolls. So somebody says, what else about Pergamon that's so important? Well, it, it was the center, not only for education, but it was the center also for religion. Pergamon had a, a place where you would go to a temple and there would be a god called Eclepus, and he was the healing god. So people from all around the world who had sickness would travel to Pergamon and go to the temple of Eclipus. Also it had temples of Zeus and, and uh, Domius and, and Anthony and also a temple of Caesar. It had a large hill on the back of the city and these temples would be built into the hills. And of course everybody who had a temple would try to outdo the next temple. So the church is full of a multicultural multi-educational city that's full of religion. It's just like the city of Toronto. Now, here's the problem. He starts off and he says, if you don't smarten up, I'm gonna to come to you with my double-edged sword. A double-edged sword has a, a blade where it can cut this way or backwards. And it's the strongest sword you can use in battle. But his double-edged sword, God is saying, through the writer John, it is his word. See, he doesn't need to swing a sword. All he needs to do is speak. And he says, if you don't smarten up, I'm gonna come with my double-edged sword, my word, and I'm gonna fight you. Now, but he says, you did remain faithful through Antipas. Now, let me explain to you this, okay? There is factual history 
and there is rumor history. I don't know if you like to study history, but the fact is this, factual history is where it's a fact. Example, the Holocaust is a fact, okay? We know that. Although there are some professors now around the world that are teaching the Holocaust never existed. Did you know that there are, there are actresses and actresses in Hollywood that believe that the Twin Towers in New York did not go down because of that. It was just a, a constructional problem. Re absolutely ridiculous. See, the, but there is also historical rumors. So Antipas, oh, this is so gross. It's not historical evidence, but it's historical rumor that he was the first Christian to die from a brazen bull. Now let me explain to you what a brazen bull is, okay? Just for some of you. In John's day when he wrote this, how you could make money is come up with a new way to kill somebody, and if the Roman government liked it, they would make it and they would pay you for it. It's like some of you, you're filthy rich because you made an app. Well, in John's day, if you came up with something that would kill somebody, the government would pay for it, okay? So, so watch this. The brazen bull is the size of this stage. It's made out of iron. And what it was, it was an image of a bull. And the only air passage is in the nose with two nostrils. But at the back of it, they had a little door they would open and they would take Antipas, who's a Christian, and they would push him into the brazen bowl. And then they would set a fire underneath him. And what happens is as he screamed, as he died, the noise would come out through the horns, the, through the nose of the bull, and it would sound like a noise of a bull. And people would come and pay to watch this. And when he's dead, they would open the door and pull his carcass out and then throw it into the fire. We're not sure if this happened or not, but we are sure that his death was absolutely amazing for one reason. The Bible says that the church was faithful and also Antipas was faithful. So it must have been some unbelievable martyrdom to do this. Let, let, let me take you on. Then he says, but I hold this against you. you you're, you're, you're doing the teaching of Balaam and Balak, which is eating food from idols and also sexual immorality. And this has come into the church. And you've mixed God's purity, Jesus' purity with this because of all the religious and educational people around. In other words, you've watered the gospel down because of the pressure of your city. Then you've also lowered your standards because you now do the, the, the thing of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were people who would sin, sin, really sin, sexual immorality, orgies, swapping of of spouses, all this stuff, Monday to Saturday. And then when they came on the Sabbath, they would say, God's grace forgives us. See, and, and all of a sudden, John is writing this from the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's saying to the church, look, this has come into your church. And he says, repent. And when you do, I will give you manna, which is the bread of life, which Jesus talked about, and I will give you a white stone with a new name on it. Now, what is the white stone? Watch this, okay? When, when you went to trial and the judge said you're innocent, the judge would give you a white stone. So wherever you walked and somebody said, oh, you're the murderer, you would pull out the white stone and go, no, I'm not. I've been pardoned or I'm innocent. The second thing is, he, he would put a new name on it for you. 
So instead of me being called Billy Richards, which I would be known in my town as the murderer, Billy Richards is the murderer, the judge would put on the stone a new name, so he would call me Tom Cruise. So from then on, I would just put, no, I'm Tom Cruise. Two feet taller, but I'm Tom Cruise. So, so here, the whole thing is, what the Holy Spirit's saying through John is this, if you repent, you'll get the bread of life, and I will totally pardon you from this perversion you've done in the church. So, so here's the application, are you ready? Number one, we just do application according to scripture, okay? Number one, repent. It's not just saying, God forgive me, but it's turning away. It's turning away and doing the opposite. So if somebody is making me go into sin, I turn away. If something is making me go into sin, I turn away. And I do the opposite, biblical opposite. Or if my mind is making me sin, I do the biblical opposite. Now, here's the second one. Stop mixing Jesus with idolatry. Let me show you what I mean. I have some water here. And I pour it in here, okay? I'll keep the lid off. And then I have this. And this is the church in Pergamon. What happened is they were mixing. They were mixing. Now, now, who in their right mind? And, and this is what, what the Holy Spirit's saying, church in Pergamon. Why, why are you mixing? Why are you mixing Jesus with idolatry? Because the fact is this, you're going to die if you drink it. And every week they came together, and not, it wasn't the whole church, but every week they came together. <laughs> and they mixed Jesus. Don't tell me. Don't tell me this sermon is not relevant to you. How many of you men have your lucky tie or your lucky underwear? Oh, come on. Every man has a certain underwear in his drawer that you wear on lucky days. Come on! Don't mock me, I know it's true. And some of you ladies, you have your lucky outfit or your lucky lipstick. The poor person who carries a rabbit's tail to give them luck. Talk to the rabbit. Never gave that rabbit luck. Or how about some of you? You, 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 you know your horoscope. You know exactly what it says every day. And this is mixing idolatry. See, what is idolatry? Anything that stands between you and God, anything that poisons the living water, which is Jesus Christ, anything that dilutes it, 
watering down the double-edged sword, which is the word of God, is idolatry. Well, I believe all scriptures except that one. That's idolatry. And sometimes it's not a person, and sometimes it's not an action, sometimes it's just a thought. Example, some of you, 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 you know right well that you go a certain way to work, and if you go that certain way, it's gonna be a good day. If you don't, and you go the other way, it's gonna be a bad day. That's idolatry. Some of you, 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 is, you don't even know what idolatry is. Let, let me take you to step three. Start living for Jesus only. Somebody who's cocky would say, oh, so I'm not, I don't have to live for my wife. I don't have to live for my children. Just live for Jesus. You know what? You cocky person, you have no idea what I just said. See, when you live for Jesus only, then you live by the word, the double-edged sword, and when you live by the double-edged sword, the, the Bible says, husbands, treat your wife the way Jesus treats the church. See, see, when you live for Jesus only, then you start to put things in proper. See, it's not I have the Bible and I also have another textbook over here or another rule book over here. No, I have the Bible. I have the double-edged sword. And I'm sorry, at work, I can't do that. I apologize. If you want to fire me, please fire me. But the fact is this, my Bible teaches me this. I can't do that. Or a friend says to you, come on. No, I'm sorry, I can't. My Bible teaches me. See, a lot of us, what we do is we, 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 we live for Jesus 99% of our life, but there's that little 1% that we will not give up. Number four, listen to this. You need to examine, eliminate, enter, and enjoy. Let, let me go through this. When was the last time you stopped throwing stones at somebody else and you just sat down and started looking at is there anything in my life that's an idol, that's standing in between God and me? My, my boys know this. There isn't anything in my life, if God told me to give it up, and I say this, and, and I hope it's true when it comes to, the, I want to give up. I would give up in 30 seconds. Let me give you an illustration. If, if we were in a communist country or a country persecuted Christian and somebody held a gun to my son's head and said, I'm gonna shoot your son if you don't deny Jesus Christ, my next words would be, son, I love you very much, bye-bye. The reason is this, you have to examine Number two, you have to eliminate. Years ago, I had a lucky tie. I hate wearing ties. But everybody said, when you wear a tie, you know, you gotta wear a tie this funeral. So I always wore the same tie all the time because it, it, you know what, this tie, every time I wore it, things happened good. And all of a sudden, God said to me, you're treating that like a lucky tie. No, it just happens that every time I wear this tie, things happen good. Well, that's your lucky tie. So I got rid of it. There's sometimes when you have to eliminate somebody who's a friend because they're pulling you down. They're polluting you. There's sometimes you have to eliminate a thought. Number two, you enter. You enter into what God wants, not what you want. Years ago, I, I was invited to work for one of the large news organizations in the United States. 
I won't tell you which one, NBC, CBS, ABC, CNN, but one of them offered me a large job, 75,000 US dollars. And this was in 1980. So think about 75,000 US back then. And God said to me, no. I want you to go and work for 100 Huntley Street. They paid nothing. But see, I, I had to eliminate and then enter into what God wanted. And the last one is enjoy. I don't regret it. Matter of fact, I'm absolutely thrilled. You won't believe the hand of God and how he's touched me in my life. Jack Hayford, he tells this incredible story about how he had a church, he was pastoring church on the way in 6,000 people in Los Angeles, California. And, and all of a sudden, uh, he just kept having the same imagination it was a pastor who lived two hours north of him. He wasn't really good friends with him. He didn't know him. And he would see this guy speak to him, say, Jack, you have to quit. You're no good as a pastor. Now, the pastor never said this. It was his imagination. And I don't know about you, but sometimes my imagination can wear me down. Sometimes my imagination is the idol that's hurting me with my relationship with God. Jack Hayford uh, turns around and he says, after two, three months of this, he says, I was totally exhausted. And one morning I woke up at four o'clock in the morning, I got out of bed and I, 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 just, I just wanted to go for a walk. And my wife, Anna, jumped out and said, I'm coming with you. And they went out on the road and just started walking. And Jack Hayford said, Anna, for the last two, three months, I think it's three months, he says, I've been seeing this guy in my head and you know, you need to quit the church. It's, you know, da, 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 da. He says, I'm exhausted. And Anna turns to Jack and says, Jack, it's an idol. It's an imagination. It's standing in between you and God, God's will. And immediately on the street, they just started coming against it. In Jesus' name, we come against this idol. We destroy it. We eliminate it. Now, we enter into the Holy Spirit protection, and we enter into the Holy Spirit joy. And all of a sudden, Jack Hayford, he just felt totally delivered. Now, watch this. He goes into the shower to get ready to go to work. He's so happy. And all of a sudden, the imagination comes to him and says, you think you got rid of me? And Jack Hayford broke out laughing in the shower and said, I did. In the name of Jesus, you're gone. That's the last time he saw it. An idol. This guy came to me a number of years ago and he talked to me about how he worked with this lady at work and the two of them did these projects together and she would say to him, let, let, let's just stay in a little, little longer tonight. I'll order in supper. And before long, it was supper in a restaurant with her. And before long, he wasn't coming home much. And he said, Billy, it didn't happen overnight. It was three years before I committed adultery. And he said, not only did I wreck my marriage, but he said, I wrecked my relationship with Christ. And he said, I didn't even know it was happening. See, a lot of us, we don't know the idol or the idolatry in our life. We, we don't even know it. because we've been deceived, we've been misled. Can, can I show it to you? This is water. This, my friend, is apple juice. <laughs> 
See, here's the craziest thing. Who in their right mind would drink gas? <laughs> but see, let me share this, and I'll do it the opposite way. Idolatry sometimes looks biblical and smells biblical, but it's not biblical. And this is what's messing the Christians up today, where it looks like a gas container and it pours like a gas container, but that crazy pastor put apple juice in it. And this is exactly what happened to Pergamon, where guys, church, you, you've remained faithful. Even when Antipas was, was martyred, the church remained faithful to my name, but guess what? You've let the, these people sneak into your church. See, see, idolatry in my life, a lot of times I don't know it's idolatry until I get into the Word, until I let the Holy Spirit talk to me, until I sit down with spiritual leadership and say, look, I don't know if this is idolatry or not idolatry. Listen, if it's not idolatry, then you have nothing to hide. If it is idolatry, then you get rid of it. Many times I will phone my friend Chuck and I will say to him, Chuck, I don't know if this is of God or not of God. And Chuck will say, well, it doesn't matter. If you have any questions, run from it. Because the Bible says run, flee from the appearance of evil. Not just flee from evil, flee from the appearance of evil. And somebody says, oh, you're just a fuddy-duddy. You're just a conservative Christian. No, I'm not a conservative Christian or a liberal Christian. Don't you tag me. I'm a biblical Christian. I'm tired of these people who are conservative and liberal and, and you know, green and blue and red. It's time that we were Biblical. Lord, if there's something that is idolatry in my life, in actions or people or, or thoughts or anything else, please show it to me. Please show it to me so that I can have pure purity in you, Christ. I remember the guy crying in my office, the guy who committed adultery, he just said, I, I never once thought this would ever happen to me. And it just slowly crept into my life. And he cried and he said, it destroyed me. And that's exactly what idolatry will do, destroy you. Friends, here's the key. Biblically, does Jesus want me to think this? Does Jesus want me to say this? Does Jesus want me to do this? Does Jesus want me to own this? Does Jesus want me to buy this? Biblically. When I taught in, in Bible college, there was a young man who, who was going around the dormitory showing everybody a bathing suit magazine. And I called him into my office and said, what are you doing? He says, well, they're dressed. They have bathing suits on. I said to him, you realize that you're hurting the heart of God. Whatsoever things are pure and holy, think on those things. They're dressed. I said, you know exactly what they're doing posing in that bathing suit magazine. I said, stop lying to God and stop lying to yourself. Oh, by the way, he never did correct his ways. And that's why his wife and him are divorced today. 
That's why he's not in ministry today. I'll tell you why. Because he never dealt with the idol. You know the biggest liar in my life? It's not the devil. It's not people around me. It's myself. And I am asking you to examine, to eliminate, to enter into what the Bible wants, and then to enjoy Jesus.